Act One of Dandy Dick by Arthur Wing Panero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dandy Dick, an original farce in three acts by Arthur Wing Panero. Dramatis Personae. The Very Reverend Augustine Jed, Doctor of Divinity. Dean of St. Marvels. Read by Todd. Sir Tristram Marden, Baronet. Read by Son of the Exiles. Major Tarver, Blanketh Hussars. Quartered at Durnston near St. Marvel. Read by Craig Franklin. Mr. Darby, Blank Hussars. Quartered at Durnstone near St. Marvels. Read by Jason in Panama. Blore, Butler at the Deanery, read by Thomas Peter. Noah Topping, Constable at St. Marvell's, read by Alan Mapstone. Atcham, Sir Tristran's Groom, read by Roger Moline. Georgiana Tidman, a widow, the Dean's sister, read by Sonia. Salome, the Dean's daughter. Read by Lian Yao. Sheba, the Dean's daughter. Read by Devorah Allen. Hannah Topping, formerly in service at the Deanery. Read by Avai. Stage directions read by Sandra Schmidt. Act One, at the Deanery, St. Marvels, morning. The morning room in the Deanery of St. Marvels with a large, arched opening leading to the library on the right, and a deeply recessed window opening out to the garden on the left. It is a bright spring morning, and an air of comfort and serenity pervades the place. Salome, a tall, handsome, dark girl of about three-and-twenty, is sitting with her elbows resting on her knees, staring wildly into vacancy. Sheba, a fair little girl of about seventeen, wearing short petticoats, shares her despondency and lies prostrate upon the settee. Oh, oh my, oh my, oh my! Sheba, sitting upright. Oh my gracious goodness, goodness gracious me! They both walk about excitedly. There's only one terrible word for it. It's a fix. It's worse than that. It's a scrape. How did you ever get let into it? How did we get let into it? Halve Sheba, please. It was Major Tarver's proposal, and I believe, Salome, that it is to you Major Tarver is paying attention. The fancy dress masked ball at Durnstone is promoted by the officers of the Hussars. I believe that the young gentleman you have impressed calls himself an officer, though he is merely a lieutenant. Sheba, indignantly. Mr. Darby is certainly an officer. A small officer. How dare you gird at me, Salome? Very well, then. When tonight we appear at the Durnstone Athenian, unknown to dear Papa, on the arms of Major Tarver and Mr. Darby, I consider that we shall be equally wicked. Oh, how can we be so wrong? Well, we're not wrong yet. We're only going to be wrong. That's a very different matter. That's true. Besides, there's this to remember. We're inexperienced girls and have only dear papa. But oh, now that the ball is tonight, I repent, Sheba, I repent. I shan't do that till tomorrow, but oh, how I shall repent tomorrow. Salome, taking an envelope from her pocket and almost crying. You'd repent now if you'd seen the account for the fancy dresses. Has it come in? Yes, the major enclosed it to me this morning. You know, Sheba. Major Tarver promised to get the dresses made in London, so I gave him our brown paper patterns to send to the costumier. Sheba, shocked. <gasps> oh, Salome, do you think he quizzed them? No. I sealed them up and marked outside, to be opened only by a lady. <sighs> That's all right. I hate the plan of myself in brown paper. Well, of course, Major Tarver begged to be allowed to pay for the dresses, and I said... I couldn't dream of permitting it. And then he said he should be most unhappy if he didn't. And 
just as I thought he was going to have his own way, bursting into tears, he cheered up and said he'd yield to a lady. Taking a large account from the envelope, and, oh, he's yielded. Read it. Don't spare me. Salome, reading. Debtor to Louis Isaacs, Costumia to the Queen, Bow Street, One Gown, Period French Revolution, 1798. Fifteen guineas? Sheba, sinking on her knees, clutching the table. Oh! Trimmings, linings, bottoms, frillings, seven guineas! Sheba, hysterically. Yeah! That's mine! Sheba, putting her fingers into her ears. Now for mine, ooh! Salome, reading. One skirt and bodice, flower girl, period uncertain, ten guineas. Less than yours, what a shame! Trimmings, linings, bottoms, frillings, five guineas, extras, two guineas. Total, forty pounds, nineteen. Ladies' own brown paper patterns mislaid. Terms. Cash. They throw themselves into each other's arms. Oh, Sheba! Salome, are there forty pounds in the wide world? My heart weighs twenty. What shall we do? If we were only a few years older, I should suggest that we wrote nice notes to Papa and committed suicide. Brought up as we have been? That's out of the question. Then let us be brave, women. And wear the dresses. Of course we'll do that, but the bill! We must get dear Papa in a good humour and coax him to make us a present of money. He knows we haven't been charitable in the town for ever so long. Poor dear Papa. He hasn't paid our proper dressmaker's bill yet, and I'm sure he's pressed for money. But we can't help that when we're pressed for money. Poor dear Papa. Suppose poor Papa refuses to give us a present. Then we must play the piano when he's at work on his concordance. Poor dear Papa. However, don't let us wrong poor Papa in advance. Let us try to think how nice we shall look. Oh, yes. Shan't I? Oh, I shall. And as for stealing out of the house with Major Tarver when poor dear Papa has gone to bed, why, Gerald Tarver would die for me. So would Nugent Darby for me. Besides, I'm not old enough to know better. You're not so very much younger than I, Sheba. Indeed, Salome. Then why do you keep me in short skirts? Why, you cruel girl! You know I can't lengthen you till I'm married. Blore, the butler, a venerable-looking person with rather a clerical suggestion about his dress, enters by the window, benignly. The two soldier gentlemen have just rowed up, Miss Salome. The girls clutch each other's hands. You mean Major Tarver? And Mr. Darby. They have called to inquire after poor Papa. Poor Papa? Shall I show them in, Miss Sheba? Yes, Blore, dear. And hang your hatches on the hat stand. Blore laughs sweetly at Sheba and shakes his fingers at her playfully, vindictively behind their backs. I sees. He goes out. Am I all right, Sheba? Yes, am I? Yes. Looking out at window. Here they are. How well Gerald Tarver dismounts. Oh. He left his liver in India, didn't he? No, only part of it. Well, part of it. And that he gave to his queen, brave fellow. Sheba, seating herself in an artificial attitude. Where shall we be? Here? Salome, running to the piano. All right. You be admiring my voice. Oh, I dare say. Here they are, and we're doing nothing. Let's run away and then come in unconsciously. Yes, unconsciously. They run off through the library. Blore shows in Major Tarver and Mr. Darby, who are both in regimentals. Major Tarver is a middle-aged, tall, angular officer with a thin face, yellow complexion, and red eyes. He's alternately in a state of great excitement and depression. Mr. Darby is a mere boy, but with a pompous, patronizing manner. The dean's out of the way, eh? Yes, sir, he is. Eh? How is the dean? Never mind, perhaps Miss Jed is at home. Yes, sir, 
she hiss it would be discourteous to run away without asking miss jed after her father darby throwing himself on the settee deuced bad form the ladies were here a minute ago salome and sheba walk in together salome has her arm round her sister's waist and looks up to her with a sweet trusting smile they start in confusion on seeing tarva and darby major tarva mr darby tarva taking salome's hand eagerly my dear miss jed darby rising and putting a glass to his eye Haya, haya. salome with her hand on her heart you you quite startled us tava in an agony of contrition oh did we awfully cut up to hear it we never dreamt of finding two visitors for papa why you told me to show the gentleman him miss sheba the two girls start guiltily and glare at blore salome with suppressed rage you needn't wait, Blore. Blore to himself. Let him hang that on the hat stand. Blore goes out. Darby and Sheba stroll together into the library. Tava to Salome. We thought we'd ride over directly after parade to make the final arrangements for tonight. Have the costumes arrived? Yes, they came yesterday in a hamper labelled Miss Jed, Secretary, Cast of Clothing Distribution League that was my idea came to me in the middle of the night dear major tarver surely this terrible strain on your nerves is very very bad for you with your your my liver say the word miss jed salome drooping her head oh major tarver it is frightfully injurious of course i'm excited now and you see me at my best but the alternating fits of hopeless despondency are shocking to witness and to endure oh it's all that damned india oh what have i said you will never forgive me indeed indeed i will never oh miss jed my forgetfulness has brought me one of my terrible attacks of depression major tarva she leads him to a chair into which he sinks in a ghastly state darby strolls in from the library with sheba darby to sheba your remarks about the army are extremely complimentary on behalf of the army i thank you we fellows are not a bad sort take us all round there's a grand future before you isn't there well i suppose there is if i go on as i'm going now tava to salome thanks the attack is past how about tonight? At what time is the house entirely quiet? Poor dear papa goes round with Blore at half past nine. After that, all is rest and peacefulness. Then, if we are here with the closed carriage at ten. They go together into the library. Darby to Sheba. Some of us army men can slave too. Tarver's queer liver has thrown all the arrangements for the fancy ball on my shoulders salome and tava re-enter look at him that's when he's enjoying life <laughs> oh good eh miss jed but suppose dear papa should hear us crunching down the gravel path oh he sinks onto the settee with a vacant stare his arms hanging helplessly darby to sheba there now his career is a burden to him oh would you like a glass of water, Major Tarver? Tarver, taking Salome's hand. Thank you, dear Miss Jed, with the least suggestion of cayenne pepper in it. Sheba, looking out at window. Oh, Salome! Papa! Papa! The Dean? The Dean! They all collect themselves in a fluster. The two girls go to meet their father, who enters at the window with his head bowed and his hands behind his back, in deep thought the dean is a portly man of about fifty with a dignified demeanour a suave voice and persuasive manner and a noble brow surmounted by silver-grey hair blore follows the dean carrying some books a small bunch of flowers and an umbrella salome tenderly 
papa pepsy the dean rouses himself discovers his children and removes his hat the dean to salome salome to sheba my toy child he draws the girls to him and embraces them then sees tava and darby dear me strangers tava and darby coughing uncomfortably <coughs> salome reproachfully taking his hat from him papa major tava and mr darby have ridden over from dunstone to ask how your court is sheba takes the gold-rimmed pince-nez which hangs upon the dean's waistcoat and places it before his eyes dear me major mr garvey mr darby darby how good of you with his girls still embracing him he extends a hand to each of the men my cold is better blore goes out to the library major mr garvey these inquiries strike me as being so kind that i must insist no no i beg that you will share our simple dinner with us to-night at six o'clock tava disconcerted oh mm -hmm. let me see tuesday night is leg of mutton papa thank you mutton hot and custards pepsy thank you toy child custards cold and a welcome warm tava looking to salome uh, well i uh salome nods her head to him violently that is certainly dean certainly delighted my dear dean delighted the dean gives darby a severe look and with an important cough he walks into the library the men and the girls speak in undertones tava depressed now what will happen tonight why don't you see as you will have to drive over to dine you will both be here on the spot ready to take us back to dunstone the dean sits at his desk in the library of course when we're turned out we can hang about in the lane till you're ready yes but when are we to make our preparations it'll take me a long time to look like charles the first we can drive about durnstone while you dress salome to tava admiringly charles the first oh major that was my idea charles the martyr you know tarver's a martyr to his liver see oh shan't we all look magnificent oh grand idea the whole thing regular army notion they are all in a state of great excitement when the dean re-enters with an anxious look carrying a bundle of papers here is papa they rush to various seats all in constrained attitudes tava to the dean no, we waited to say good morning the dean taking his hand abstractedly how kind good morning six o'clock sharp dean at six punctually salome represent me by escorting these gentlemen to the gate salome tava and darby go out sheba is following slyly when the dean looks up from his papers sheba pepsy check me in a growing tendency to dislike mr garvey at dinner sheba watch that i carve for him fairly yes pepsy the dean turns away and sits on the settee sheba with her head down and her hands folded walks towards the door and then bounds out the dean turning the papers over in his hand solemnly bills he rises walks thoughtfully to a chair sits and examines papers again bills he rises again walks to another chair and sinks into it with a groan bills salome and sheba re-enter salome to sheba in a whisper papa's alone a beautiful opportunity to ask for that little present of money poor dear papa poor, poor dear, dear papa. papa they link their hands together and walk as if going out through the library the dean looking up don't go children he rises the girls rush to him and laughing with joy they turn him like a top dancing around him <laughs> stop children 
Pepsi's in a good humor. Salome, pinching his chin. He always is. Pepsi will listen to our little wants. They force him into a chair. Salome sits on the ground, embracing his legs. Sheba lies on the top of the table. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Your wants are very little ones. What are they, Salome? What are they, toy child? Papa, have you any spare cash? Spare cash? Playful Salome. Pounds, shillings, and pence, Pepsi. Or pounds, shillings, Pepsi, and never mind the pence. <laughs> I am glad, really glad, children, that you have broken through a reserve which has existed on this point for at least a fortnight, and babbled for money. Sheba and Salome, laughing with delight. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me the opportunity of meeting your demands with candor. Children, I have love for you, solicitude for you, but I have no spare cash for anybody. He rises and walks gloomily across to the piano, on the top of which he commences to arrange his bills. In horror, Salome scrambles up from the floor, and Sheba wriggles off the table. Simultaneously, they drop onto the same chair and huddle together. Salome, to herself. Lost. Sheba, to herself. Done for. And now you have so cheerily opened the subject, let me tell you with equal good humor emphatically flourishing the bills. That this sort of thing must be put a stop to. Your dressmaker's bills is shocking. Your milliner gives an analytical record of the feverish beatings of the hot pulse of fashion. Your general draper blows a rancorous blast which would bring dismay to the stoutest heart. Let me for once peel out a deep paternal base to your childish treble and say emphatically, I've had enough of it. He paces up and down. The two girls utter a loud yell of grief. Ugh! Sheba, through her tears. We've been brought up as young ladies. That can't be done for nothing. Sheba's small, but she cuts into a lot of material. My girls, it is such unbosomings as this which preserve the domestic union of a family. Weep, howl, but listen. The total of these weeds which bring up in the beautiful garden of paternity is a hundred and fifty-six, eighteen, three. Now, all the money I can immediately command is considerably under five hundred pounds. Oh, Papa! Oh, what a lot! Hush! But read, Salome. Read aloud this paragraph in The Times of Yesterday. There, my child. He hands a copy of The Times to Salome with his finger upon a paragraph. Salome, reading. A munificent offer. Dr. Jed, the Dean of St. Marvel's, whose anxiety for the preservation of the minister's fire threatens to undermine his health, has subscribed a munificent sum of one thousand pounds to the restoration fund. Oh! Oh! And we gasping for clothing. Read on, my child. On condition that seven other donors come forward, each with a like sum. And will they? The dean anxiously. My darling, times are bad, but one never knows. If they don't... Then you will have your new summer dresses as usual. Salome, hoarsely. But if they do, speak, father. The dean, gloomily. Then we will all rejoice. 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 And retrench. To ours, little ones. Retrench and rejoice. The two girls cling to each other as Blore comes from the library with two letters on a salver. The second post, sir, just hidden. The dean, blandly. Thank you. Blore, hearing Salome and Sheba crying. They were the scolding hussies. Let them hang them at stand. He's going out. The dean, opening letters. Oh, Blore. This note from Mr. Hodder, the secretary of the Sport and Relaxation Repression Guild, reminds me that tomorrow is the first day of the races, the St. Marvel Spring Meeting, as it is called. Indeed, sir. Fancy that. And I not know it. All our servants may not resemble you, Blore. Pray remind them in the kitchen and the stable of the rule of the house. No servant allowed to leave for dinnery, 
on any pretense while the races is on the dean kindly while the races are on thank you blore opens his second letter thank you sir to himself oh if the dean only knew the good thing i could put him on to for the durnstone handicap he goes out children salome sheba here is good news salome running to him good news what is it your aunt left us some money your aunt is coming to live with us to what to live with us what aunt my dear widowed sister georgiana tidman what's she like we don't want her good gracious georgiana and i reconciled after all these years she will help us to keep the expenses down keep the expenses down the dean embracing his daughters a second mother to my girls she will implant the precepts of retrenchment if their father cannot but papa who is aunt what's her name who is she my dears a mournful miserable history with his head bent he walks to a chair and holds out his hands to the girls who go to him and kneel at his feet when you were infants your aunt georgiana married an individual whose existence i feel it my sad duty never to recognize a bad man he died ten years ago and therefore we shall say a misguided man he was a person who bred horses to run in races for amusement combined with profit he was also what is called a gentleman jockey and it was your aunt's wifely boast that if ever he vexed her she could take a stone off his weight in half an hour in due course his neck was dislocated by aunt hush child no you will be little wiser when i tell you he came a cropper how awful it all sounds left a widow you would think it natural that georgiana tidman would have flown to her brother himself a widower not at all maddened i hope by grief she continued the career of her misguided husband and for years to use her own terrible words she was the daisy of the turf what's that i don't know toy child but at length retribution came ill luck fell upon her her horses stocks everything came to the hammer that was my hour come to me i wrote my children yearn for you sheba and salome with wry faces oh, oh. at the deanery of st marvel's with the cares of a household and a stable which contains only a thirteen-year-old pony you may obtain rest and forgetfulness and she is coming when, when? Oh, oh when she merely says soon sheba and salome stamping with vexation oh. salome sheba you will i fear find her a sad broken creature a weary fragment a wave-tossed derelict let it be your patient endeavor to win back a flickering smile to the wan features of this chastened widow blore enters with a telegram a telegram sir the dean opens telegram no aunt tidman flickers a smile at me i wouldn't be in her shoes for something salt in her bed salome yes and the peg out of the rattling window they grip hands earnestly good gracious bless me girls your aunt georgiana slept at the wheat sheaf at durnston last night and is coming on this morning today, today. blore tell willis to get the chaise out blore hurries out salome child you and i will drive into durnston we may be in time to bring your aunt over my hat sheba quick the clang of the gate bell is heard in the distance the bell looking out of window no yes it can't be children i wonder if this is your aunt georgiana blore appears with a half frightened surprised look mrs tidman georgiana tidman enters she's a jovial noisy woman very horsey in manners and appearance and dressed in pronounced masculine style with billycock hat and coaching coat 
the girls cling to each other the dean recoils well gus my boy how are you the dean shocked georgiana georgiana patting the dean's cheeks you're putting on too much flesh augustine they should give you a ten miler daily in a blanket the dean with dignity my dear sister are these your two year olds to salome kiss your aunt she kisses salome with a good hearty smack to sheba kiss your aunt she embraces sheba then stands between the two girls and surveys them critically touching them alternately with the end of her cane lord bless you both what names do you run under i i am salome i am sheba georgiana looking at sheba why little un your stable companion could give you a stone and then get her nose in front the dean who has been impatiently fuming georgiana i fear these poor innocents don't follow your well-intentioned but inappropriate illustrations oh we'll soon wake em up well augustine my boy it's nearly twenty years since you and i munched our corn together our estrangement has been painfully prolonged since then we've both run many races <laughs> though we've never met in the same events the world has ridden us both pretty hard at times gus hasn't it we've been punished and pulled and let down pretty often but here we are tapping him sharply in the chest with her cane sound in the wind yet you're doing well gus and they say you're going up the hill neck and neck with your bishop i've dropped out of it the mares don't last gus and it's good and kind of you to give me a dry stable and a clean litter and to keep me out of the shafts of a shrewsbury and talbot sheba in a whisper to salome salome i don't quite understand her but i like aunt so do i but she's not my idea of a wary fragment or a chastened widow my dear georgiana i rejoice that you meet me in this affectionate spirit and when pardon me when you have a little caught the tone of the deanery oh i'll catch it if i don't the deanery will a little catch my tone the same thing sheba laughs toy child oh trust george tidd for setting things quite square in a palace or a puddle george tidd who is george tidd i am george tidd that was my racing name ask after george tidd at newmarket they'll tell you all about me my colours were crimson and black diamond there you are producing her pocket handkerchief which is crimson and black dear me very interesting georgiana my dear one moment children the girls go into the library the dean tapping the handkerchief i understand distinctly from your letter that all this is finally abandoned oh worse luck they'll never see my colours at the post again and the contemplation of sport generally as a mental distraction oh yes i dare say you'll manage to wean me from that too in time in time well but georgiana the gate bell is heard again the girls re-enter there's a visitor i'll tootle upstairs and have a groom down to salome and sheba make the running girls at what time do we feed augustine there is luncheon at one o'clock right the air here is so fresh i shan't be sorry to get my nose bag on she stalks out accompanied by the girls my dear georgiana my widowed sister georgiana dear me i am quite disturbed surely surely the serene atmosphere of the deanery will work a change it must it must if not what a grave mistake i have made good gracious no no i won't think of it still it is a little unfortunate that poor georgiana should arrive here on the very eve of those terrible races at st marvel's blore enters with a card who is it blore reading the card sir tristran marden dear dear 
Certainly, Bloor, certainly. Bloor goes out. Marden. Why, Marden and I haven't met since Oxford. Bloor re-enters, showing in Sir Tristram Marden, a well-preserved man of about fifty, with a ruddy face and jovial manner, the type of the thorough English sporting gentleman. Bloor goes out. Hello, Chad, how are you? My dear Marden, are we boys again? Sir Tristram, boisterously. Of course we are, boys again. He hits the dean violently in the chest. The dean, breathing heavily to himself. I quite forgot how rough Marden used to be. How it all comes back to me. Think I've changed? Only in appearance. I'm still a bachelor. Got terribly jilted by a woman years ago and have run in blinkers ever since. Can't be helped, can it? You're married, aren't you? I have been a widower for fifteen years. Oh, Lord, awfully sorry. Can't be helped, though, can it? Seizing the dean's hand and squeezing it. Forgive me, old chap. The dean, withdrawing his hand with pain. Oh, oh, oh. I've reopened an old wound. Damn stupid of me. Hush, Marden, please. All right. What do you think I'm down here for? For the benefit of your health, Marden? <laughs> Never had an ache in my life. Shan't come and hear you preach next Sunday, Gus. I do not preach next Sunday. You'd better not. No, I'm here for the races. The race? Hush, my dear Marden. My girls. Girls? May I trot them into the paddock tomorrow? Thank you, no. Think it over. You've seen the list of starters for the Durnstone Handicap? No, I haven't. Not? Look here, Sir Tristram Martin's dandy dick. Nine stone till Tom Gallowood up. What do you think of that? I don't think of anything like that. Sir Tristram, digging the dean in the ribs. Look out for my colours. Black and white, and a pink cap. First past the post tomorrow. Really, my dear Martin? Good heavens, Jed. They talk about Bonnie Betsy. I grieve to hear it. The tongue of scandal. Sir Tristram, taking the dean's arm and walking him about. Can you imagine, sir, for one moment, that Bonnie Betsy with a boy on her back could get down that hill tomorrow with those legs of hers? Another horse, I presume? No, a bay mare. George didn't knew what she was about when she stuck to dandy dick to the very last. The dean, aghast. George? Tid? Georgiana Tidman. Dandy came out of her stable after she smashed. Bless me. Poor old George. I wonder what's become of her. My dear Marden, I am, of course, heartily pleased to revive in this way your old acquaintance. I wish it were in my power to offer you the hospitality of the deanery, but... Don't name it. My horse and I are over at the Swan. Come and look at Dandy Dick. Martin, you don't understand. My position in St. Marvel's... Oh, I see, Jed. I beg your pardon. You mean that the colours you ride in don't show up well on the hill yonder, or in the stable of the Swan Inn? You must remember... I remember that in your young days you made the heaviest book on the derby of any of our fellows. I always lost, Martin. Indeed, I always lost. I remember that you once matched a mare of your own against another of Lord Bexlade's for fifty pounds. But she wasn't in it, Martin. I mean, she was dreadfully beaten. Sir Tristram, shaking his head sorrowfully. Oh, Jed, Jed, other times, other manners. Goodbye, old boy. You're not, you're not offended, Martin. Sir Tristram, taking the dean's hand. Offended? No, only sorry, dean, damned sorry. 
to see a promising lad come to an end like this. Georgiana enters with Salome on one side of her and Sheba on the other, all three laughing and chatting, apparently the best of friends. By Jove! No! What? Tid! Hello, Marden! They shake hands warmly. Of all places in the world to find Mr. Tid! <laughs> Why, Dean, you've been chaffing me, have you? No. Yes, you have. You've been roasting your old friend. Martin. Tid is a pal of yours, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Sir Tristan Martin, Mrs. Tidman is my sister. Your sister? Yes, I've been running a bit dark, Marden, but that stout, well-seasoned animal over there and this skittish creature come of the same stock and were foaled in the same stable. Pointing to Salome and Sheba, there are a couple of yearlings here you don't know. My nieces, Salome and Sheba. Sir Tristram, bowing. How do you do? Heartily taking Georgiana's hand again. Well, I don't care whose sister you are, but I'm jolly glad to see you, George, my boy. Gracious, Tris, don't squeeze my hand so. The dean, in horror. Salome, Sheba, children, I must speak to you. Excuse me, Martin. To himself. Oh, what shall I do with my widowed sister? He goes into the garden. Sheba to Salome. That's like, Pa just as we were getting interested. We'll come back in a minute. They go out by the window. Lord, how odd. You know your brother and I were at Oxford together, George? Were you, Tris? Then are you putting up here? He won't have me. Won't have you? Because I'm down here racing. You see, he's a dean. Is he? Well, then, you just lay a thousand sovereigns to a gooseberry that in this house I'm a dean, too. I suppose he's thinking of the canons and the bishop and those chaps. Lord bless your heart, they're all right when you cheer them up a bit. If I'm here till the autumn meeting, you'll find me lunching on the hill with the canons marking my cart and the dear old bishop mixing the salad. So say the word, Tris. I'll make it all right with Augustine. No, oh, thanks, old fellow. The fact is that I'm fixed at the swan with... What do you think, George? With Dandy Dick. Oh, my old Dandy. I brought him down with me in lavender. You know he runs for the Durnstone Handicap tomorrow. <laughs> no. There's precious little that horse does that I don't know, and what I don't know I dream. Is he fit? As a fiddle. Shines like a mirror. Not an ounce too much or too little. He'll romp in. He'll dance in. Tris Marden. Eh? Georgiana, mysteriously. Tris? Dandy Dick doesn't belong to you. Not all of him. No, I've only a half share. At your sale, he was knocked down to John Fielder, the trainer. The other half belongs to John. No, it doesn't. It belongs to me. George! Yes. Directly I saw Dandy Dick marched out before the auctioneer, I asked John Fielder to help me. And he did, like a Briton. For I can't live without horse flesh, if it's only a piece of cat's meat on a skewer. But when I condescended to keep company with the canons and the bishop here, I promised Augustine that I wouldn't own anything on four legs. So John sold you half of Dick, and I can swear I don't own a horse. And I don't. Not a whole one. But half a horse is better than no bread, Tris. And we're partners. <laughs> what are you laughing at, man? Oh, the dean! The dean! Salome and Sheba enter unperceived. 
I, oh, I beg your pardon, George. <laughs> well, now you know he's fit, of course. You're going to back Dan their dick for the Durnstone Handicap. Back him? For every penny I've got in the world. That isn't much. But if I'm not a richer woman by a thousand pounds tomorrow night, I shall have had a bad day. Oh, Sheba! The girls come towards the library. Georgiana, discovering them, hush, to the girls. Hello. It's only us, Aunt. The girls go into the library. I'll be off. Keep your eye on the old horse, Tristram. Don't fear. Good morning, George. Good morning, partner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do be quiet. <laughs> Say goodbye for me to the Dane. She gives him a push, and he goes out. Sheba and Salome immediately re-enter from the library. Aunt, dear aunt. Well, girls. Aunt, Salome has something to say to you. No, it's Sheba. Why, you're shivering all over. Catching hold of Sheba. Hello, little un. Aunt, dear Aunt Georgiana. We heard you say something about a thousand pounds. You've been listening. No, we only merely heard. And, oh, aunt, a thousand pounds is such a lot. And we poor girls want such a little. Money. Yes, Salome has rather got into debt. My gracious. I haven't any more than you have, Sheba. Well, I'm in debt too, but I only meant to beg for Salome. But now I ask for both of us. Oh, Aunt Tidman, Papa has told us that you have known troubles. Ah, so I have. Heaps of them. Oh, I'm so glad, because Salome and I are weary fragments, too. We're everything awful but chastened widows. We owe forty pounds unknown to Pa. Forty pounds nineteen. Why, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves, you girls. We are. We are. To cry and go on like this about forty pounds. But we've only got fifteen and threepence of our own in the world. And, oh, aunt, you know something about the races, don't you? Eh? If you do, help two poor creatures to win forty pounds nineteen. Aunt Georgiana, what's Dandy Dick you were talking to that gentleman about? <laughs> Child, Dandy Dick's a horse. We thought so. Then let Dandy Dick win us some money. No, no, I won't hear of it. Oh, do, do. Oh, do, do, do. Go away, I won't. I say decidedly, I will not. Oh, do, do. Do, do, and we'll love you for ever and ever, Aunt Georgiana. You will. She embraces them heartily. Bless your little innocent faces. Do you want to win forty pounds? Yes, 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 yes. Do you want to win fifty pounds? Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Taking her betting book from her pocket. Very well. Then put your very petticoats on Dandy Dick. The girls stand clutching their skirts, frightened. Oh, oh. End of the first act. Act Two of Dandy Dick by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two The Same Place Evening. The morning room at the deanery, with the fire and the lamps lighted. It is after dinner. Sheba is playing the piano, Salome lolling upon the settee and Georgiana pouring out tea. They are in evening dress. Sugar, Sally? I call you Sally, Salome. The evening's too short for your name. All right, Aunt George. Two lumps, please. Georgiana to Sheba. Little on? Two lumps, and one in the saucer, to eat. Quite a relief to shake off the gentleman, isn't it? Do you think so, Aunt? Oh, I don't think so. Hmm. 
now i understand why my foot was always in the way under the dinner table she holds out two cups which the girls take from her i thought the dinner was an overwhelming success all our dinners are at the deanery awfully jolly mutton was overdone that's our new cook's one failing but the potatoes weren't they rattled cook never can manage potatoes what was wrong with the custards well it was cook's first attempt at custards however they served one useful end now we know the chimney wants sweeping but it was a frightfully jolly dinner take it all round yes take it all round one has to take things all round what made us all so sad and silent taking us all round dear papa was as lively as an owl with neuralgia major tarver isn't a conversational cracker gerald tarver has no liver to speak of he might have spoken about his lungs or something to cheer us up i fancy mr darby was about to make a witty remark once yes and then the servant handed him a dish and he shied at it so we lost that still we ought to congratulate ourselves upon upon a upon a upon a <laughs> upon a frightfully jolly dinner taking her betting book from her pocket excuse me girls i've some figures to work out if dandy dick hasn't fared better at the swan than we have at the deanery he won't be in the first three reckoning let me see salome to sheba all settled sheba isn't it yes everything directly the house is silent we let ourselves out at the front door how do we get in again by this window it has a patent safety fastening so it can be opened with a hairpin we're courageous girls aren't we yes i don't consider we're ordinary young ladies at all if we had known aunt a little longer we might have confided in her and taken her with us poor aunt we mustn't spoil her darby speaking outside i venture to differ with you my dear dean oh here come the waxworks she joins the girls as darby enters through the library patronizing the dean who accompanies him ha i've just been putting the dean right about a little army question mrs mrs i can't catch your name <laughs> don't try you'd come out in spots like measles darby stands by her blankly then attempts a conversation the dean to salome and sheba children it is useless to battle against it much longer against what papa a feeling of positive distaste for mr darby oh papsy think what wellington was at his age major tarver enters pale and haggard salome meets him major <sighs> oh not well again indigestion i'm always like this after dinner but what would you do if the trumpet summoned you to battle oh i suppose i should pack up a few charcoal biscuits and toddle out you know georgiana to darby i've never studied the army guide you're thinking of the turf guide beg pardon i mean the army keeps a string of trained nurses doesn't it there are army nurses certainly i was wondering whether your colonel will send one with a perambulator to fetch you at about half past eight she leaves darby and goes to the dean sheba joins darby at the piano well gus my boy you seem out of condition i'm rather anxious for the post to bring today's times you know i've offered a thousand pounds to our restoration fund what hush i'll tell you they talk in undertones blore enters to remove the tea-tray tarver jumping up excitedly to salome hey oh certainly delighted singing to himself come into the garden ward for the black bat now you yourself again i'm always dreadfully excited when i'm asked to sing it's as good as a carbonate of soda lozenge to me to be asked to sing to blore my music is in my overcoat pocket blore crosses to the door and mr darby has brought his violin 
Tava, in a rage, glaring at Darby. Ah, there now. Darby to Blore. You'll find it in the hall. Blore goes out. The dean dozes in a chair. Salome and Sheba talk to Georgiana at the table. Tava to himself. He always presumes with his confounded fiddle when I'm going to entertain. He knows that his fiddle's never hoarse, and that I am, sometimes. Darby to himself. Tarver always tries to cut me out with his elderly chest C. He ought to put it on the retired list. Well, I'll sing him off his legs tonight. I mean lovely voice. He walks into the library and is heard trying his voice, singing Come Into the Garden, Maud. Darby to himself. He needn't bother himself. While he was dozing in the carriage, I threw his music out of the window. Tava re-enters triumphantly. Blor re-enters, carrying a violin case and a leather music roll. Darby takes the violin case, opens it, and produces his violin and music. Blor hands the music roll to Tava and goes out. Tava to Salome, trembling with excitement. My tones are like a beautiful bell this evening. I'm so glad for all our sakes. As he takes the leather music roll from Blor. Thank you, that's it. What will you begin with? Coming to the garden, Maud. I've begun with coming to the garden, Maud, for years and years. He opens the music roll. It is empty. Oh, Miss Jade, I've forgotten my music. Oh, oh Major Tarver. Oh. Tava, with a groan of despair, sinks onto the settee. Never mind. Mr. Darby will play. Darby tuning his violin will you accompany me sheba raising her eyes to the end of the world she sits at the piano my mother says that my bowing is something like joachim's and she ought to know why oh because she's heard joachim darby plays and sheba accompanies him salome sits beside tava georgiana to herself well, after all, George, my boy, you're not stabled in such a bad box. Here is a regular, pure, simple English evening at home. The Dean mumbling to himself. A thousand pounds to the restoration fund and all those bills to settle. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. What shall I do? Salome to herself. I hope my ball dress will drive all the other women mad. Tava, to himself, glaring at Darby. I feel I should like to corrupt him with his best string. Georgiana, frowning at her betting book. I think I shall hedge a bit over the crumbly stakes. Darby, as he plays, glancing at Tava. I wonder how old Tarver's chest sea likes a holiday. Sheba, as she plays. We must get Pa to bed early. Dear Papa's always so dreadfully in the way. Georgiana, looking around. <sighs> no, there's nothing like it in any other country. A regular, pure, simple English evening at home. Blore enters quickly, cutting the times with the paper knife as he enters. The paper's just arrived. The music stops abruptly. All the ladies glare at Blore and hush him down. Shh! The dean, taking the paper from Blore. This is my fault. There may be something in the Times of special interest to me. Thank you, Blore. Blore goes out. Ha ha ha! Spoils his pianissimo. The dean, scanning the paper. Oh, I can't believe it! What's the matter? Papa! Papa! The dean? The dean! Children, Georgiana, friends, my munificent offer has produced the desired result. Oh! Seven wealthy people, including three brewers, have come forward with a thousand pounds apiece in aid of the restoration of the Minster Spire. Oh! That means a cool thousand out of your pocket, Gus. Yes. Reading? The anxiety to which the Dean of St. Marvels has so long been a victim will now doubtless be relieved. With his hand to his head. I suppose I shall feel the relief tomorrow. What's wrong with the spire? 
nobody sleeps in it it is a little out of repair but hardly sufficiently so as to warrant the presumptuous interference of three brewers excuse me i think i'll enjoy the fresh air for a moment he goes to the window and draws back the curtains a bright red glare is seen in the sky bless me look there oh, oh what's, what's that? that it's a conflagration salome clinging to tava where is it are we safe sheba clinging to darby where is it are we safe where is it blore enters with a scared look the dean to blore where is it where is where it is where, is, where it? is it the old swan inn's a fire the gate bell is heard ringing violently in the distance blore goes out georgiana uttering a loud screech the swan inn you girls get me a hat and coat somebody fetch me a pair of boots Salome, Sheba, and Tava go to the window. Georgiana! Don't talk to me. To Tava. Lend me your boots. I didn't, if I once got cold extremities. Oh. <sighs> She's going. The dean stops her. Respect yourself, Georgiana. Where are you going? Going? I'm going to help clear the stables at the swamp. Remember what you are. My sister. A lady. I'm not. George Tid's a man, every inch of her. Sir Tristram rushes in breathlessly. Georgiana rushes at him and clutches his coat. Tris Marden, speak. Sir Tristram, exhausted. <sighs> the horse, the horse, you've got him out. You're safe and sound. <sighs> safe and sound. That old horse has backed himself to win the handicap. She sinks into a chair. Tava and Darby, with Salome and Sheba, stand looking out of the window. George, his tail is singed a bit. <laughs> the less weight for him to carry tomorrow. Oh, oh, dear old Dandy, he never was much to look at. The worst of it is the fools threw two pails of cold water over him to put it out. Oh, that's done him. Now, my dear Georgiana, what is a horse? A living example to a dean. The dean goes distractedly into the library. Where is the animal? My man Hatcham is running him up and down the lane here to try to get him warm again. Where are you going to put the homeless beast up now? I don't know. Georgiana, starting up. I do, though. Madwoman, what are you going to do? Bring Dandy Dick into our stables. No, no. The very place. Georgiana, pray consider me. So I will, when you've had two pails of water thrown over you. The dean walks about in despair. Martin, I appeal to you. Oh, Dean, Dean, I'm ashamed of you. Georgiana to Sir Tristram. Are you ready? Sir Tristram takes off his coat and throws it over Georgiana's shoulders. George, you're a brick. <laughs> a brick, am I? Quietly to him. One partner pulls Dandy out of the swan, the other leads Dandy into the deanery. Quits, my lad. They go out together. What is happening to me? It will be in all the sporting papers. Sir Tristan Marden's dandy dick reflected great credit upon the deanery stables. The sporting dean! He walks into the library, where he sinks into a chair, as Salome, Tava, Darby, and Sheba come from the window. They're getting the flames under. If I had had my galoshes with me, I should have been here, there, and everywhere. Where there's a crowd of civilians, the military exercise a wide discretion in restraining themselves. Sheba, to Tava and Darby. You had better go now. Then we'll get the house quiet as soon as possible. Poor Papa looks worried. Poor, Poor Papa. Papa. We will wait with the carriage in the lane. Yes, yes. Calling. Papa, Major Tava and Mr. Darby must go. She rings the bell. The dean comes from the library. Dear me, I'm very remiss. Tava, shaking hands. 
most fascinating evening darby shaking hands charming my dear dean blore enters major tarver's carriage at the gate miss salome don't risk the cold papa blore goes out followed by sheba salome and tarver darby is going when he returns to the dean by the by my dear dean come over and see me we ought to know more of each other say monday the dean restraining his anger i will not say monday any time you like oh and i say let me know when you preach and i'll get some of our fellows to give their patronage he goes out the dean closing the door after him with a bang another moment another moment and i fear i should have been violently rude to him a guest under my roof he walks up to the fireplace and stands looking into the fire as darby having forgotten his violin returns to the room oh blor now understand me if that mr darby ever again presumes to present himself at the deanery i will not see him darby with his violin in his hand haughtily i've come back for my violin goes out with dignity the dean horrified oh mr darby here an explanation mr darby he runs out after darby georgiana and sir tristram enter by the window oh don't be down tris my boy cheer up lad he'll be fit yet bar a chill <laughs> he knew me he knew me when i kissed his dear old nose he'd be a fool of a horse if he didn't feel deuced flattered at that he's no fool he knows he's in the deanery too did you see him cast up his eyes and lay his ears back when i let him in oh george george it's such a pity about his tail georgiana cheerily ah oh, not it you watch his head to-morrow that'll come in first hatcham a groom looks in at the window are you there sir what is it i just run round to tell you that dandy is a feedin as steady as a baby with a bottle don't you close your eyes all night not me mum and i've got hold of the constable here mr topping he's going to sit up with me for company's sake a constable yes sir tristram coming forward mysteriously why bless you and the lady sir supposing the fire at the swan weren't no accident eh supposing it were incinderism and supposing our horse was the object good gracious that's why i ain't going to walk single-handed get back then get back sir tristram and georgiana pace up and down excitedly right sir there's only one mortal fear i've got about our dandy what's, what's that, that? he hasn't found out about his tail yet sir and when he does it'll fret him as sure as my name's bob hatcham keep the stable pitch dark he may notice it not to-night sir but he's a proud horse and what'll he think of himself on the ill to-morrow you and me and the lady sir it'd be different with us but how's our dandy to hide his bereavement Hatcham goes out of the window with Sir Tristram as the Dean enters, followed by Blore, who carries a lighted lantern. The Dean, looking reproachfully at Georgiana. You have returned, Georgiana? Yes, thank you. And that animal? In our stables, safe and snug. Oh. You can sleep tonight with the happy consciousness of having sheltered the outcast. We're locking up now. The poor children, exhausted with the alarm, beg me to say good night for them. The fire is quite extinguished? Yes, sir. But I hear they've just sent into Durnston, asking for the military to watch the ruins in case of another outbreak. It'll stop the wicked ball at the Hathenium, it will. Drawing the window curtains, Sir Tristram, having re-entered, i suppose you want to see the last of me jed martin don't be unkind tris where shall we stow the dear old chap gus my boy where shall we stow the dear old chap i really don't know let me see 
we don't want to pitch you out of your loft if we can help it, Gus. No, no, we won't do that. But don't consider me in this manner. But there's Sheba's little cot still standing in the old nursery. Just the thing for me, the old nursery. The old nursery. <laughs> Toys to play with if you wake early. The dean, looking round. Is there anyone else before we lock up? Blore has fastened the window and drawn the curtain. Put Sir Tristram to bed carefully in the nursery, Blore. Sir Tristram, grasping the dean's hand. Good night, old boy. I'm too done for a hand of piquet tonight. I never play cards. Sir Tristram, slapping him on the back. I'll teach you during my stay at the deanery. The dean, helplessly to himself. Then he's staying with me. Good night, George. <laughs> Good night, partner. Heaven bless the little innocent in his cot. Sir Tristram goes out with Blore. Georgiana, calling after him. Tris, you may take your pipe up with you. We smoke all over the deanery. The dean, to himself. I never smoke. Does she? Georgiana closes the door, humming a tune merrily. Tra -la 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 -la. Now, Mr. Tid, we'll toddle. Ta -da -ta -da. She stops, looking at the dean, who is muttering to himself. Gus, I don't like your looks. I shall let the vet see you in the morning. What's wrong with you? The dean shakes his head mournfully and sinks on the settee. Money? There are bills which, at a more convenient time, it will be my grateful duty to discharge. And you're short. Short? Stumped, out of coin, run low. What'll square the bills? Very little would settle the bills, but, but... I know, the spire. Why, Gus, you haven't got that thousand. There is a very large number of estimable worthy men who do not possess a thousand pounds. With that number, I have the mournful pleasure of enrolling myself. When's the settling day? Eh? When will you have to fork out? Unless the restoration is immediately commenced, the spire will certainly crumble. Hmm. Then it's a match between you and the spire which parts first. Gus, will you let your little sister lend you a hand? My dear Georgiana, impossible. <laughs> no, no. Not out of my own pocket. Come here. She takes his arm and whispers in his ear. Can you squeeze a pair of ponies? Can I what? Can you raise fifty pounds? Certainly. More than fifty pounds. No, no. Don't be rash. That's the worst of you beginners. Only fifty by tomorrow morning. Most assuredly. Very well, then. Clap it onto Dandy Dick. What? He's a certainty, if those two buckets of water haven't put him off it. He's a moral, if he doesn't think of his tail coming down the hill. There's nothing like him at the weight. Keep it dark, Gus. Don't breathe a word to any of your canons or archdeacons, or they'll rush at it and shorten the price for us. Go in, Gus, my boy. Take your poor widowed sister's tip and sleep as peacefully as a blessed baby. She presses him warmly to her and kisses him. The dean extricating himself. Oh, Mrs. Tidman, go to your room. Augustine. In the morning, I will endeavor to frame some verbal expression of the horror with which I regard your proposal. For the present, you are my parent's child, and I trust your bed is well aired. Oh, very well, Augustine. I've done all I can for the spire. Bonsoir, old boy. Good night. If you're wiser in the morning, just send Blore on to the course, and he'll put the money on for you. Blore? My poor devoted old servant would be lost on a race course. <laughs> would he? He was quite at home in Tattersall Ring when I was at St. Marvel's last summer. Blore? Blore. I recognized the veteran sportsman the moment I came into the deanery. What was my butler doing at St. Marvel's races? Blore enters with his lantern. 
investing the savings of your cook and housemaid of course you don't think your servants are as narrow as you are oh i beg your pardon sir shall i go the round sir the dean gives blor a fierce look but blor beams sweetly blor mum breakfast at nine sharp and pack a hamper with a cold chicken some french rolls and two bottles of heidsieck label it george tid and send it on to the hill i'll stand the racket good night she goes out the dean sinks into a chair and clasps his forehead a oh dear high spirited lady leaning over the dean aren't you well sir serpent me and me sir walk up i'll speak to you in the morning walk up blore goes into the library turns out the lamp there and disappears what dreadful wave threatens to engulf the deanery what has come to us in a few fatal hours a horse of sporting tendencies contaminating my stables his equally vicious owner nestling in the nursery and my own widowed sister in all probability smoking a cigarette at her bedroom window with her feet on the window ledge listening what's that he peers through the window curtains i thought i heard footsteps in the garden i can see nothing only the old spire standing out against the threatening sky leaving the window shudderingly the spire my principal creditor my principal creditor the most conspicuous object in the city blore re-enters with his lantern carrying some banknotes in his hand blore laying the notes on the table i found these sir on your dressing-table they're banknotes sir the dean taking the notes thank you i placed them there to be sent to the bank tomorrow counting the notes ten ten twenty five five fifty fifty pounds the very sum georgiana urged me to oh to blur waving him away leave me go to bed go to bed go to bed blur is going blur sir what made you tempt me with these at such a moment tempt you sir the window was open and i fear they might blow away the dean catching him by the coat collar man what were you doing at st marvel's races last summer blur with a cry falling on his knees oh sir oh sir i knew that i spirited lady would bring grief and sorrow to peaceful happy deanery oh sir i have done a little on my own account from time to time on the ill also on the commission for the kitchen i knew it i knew it oh sir you are a right, old gentleman turn a charitable art to the races it is a wicious institution which spends more ready money at same marvels than us good people do in a year get up blor get up oh edward blor edward blor what weak creatures we are we are sir we are especially when we've got a tip sir think of the temptation of a tip sir i do blor i do i confess everything sir bonnet betsy's bound for to win the handicap no no she isn't she is sir i know better she can never get down the hill with those legs of hers she can sir what's to beat her the horse in my stable dandy dick dandy dick that old bit of my organy sir they are laying ten to one against him the dean with hysterical eagerness are they i'll take it i'll take it lord love you sir for how much fifty here's the money impulsively he cramps the notes into blore's hand and then recoils in horror oh sinks into a chair with a groan blore in a whisper law who'd have thought the dean was such a iron sportsman at heart he doesn't give me my notice after this to the dean of course it's understood sir that we keep our little weaknesses dark outwardly sir we remain respectable and i hope respected 
putting the notes into his pocket. I wish you good night, sir. He walks to the door. The dean makes an effort to recall him, but fails. And that old man has been my pat and an example for years and years. Oh, Edward Blore, your hider was shattered. Turning to the dean. Good night, sir. May your dreams be calm and happy, and may you have a good run for your money. Blore goes out. The dean gradually recovers his self-possession. I, I am upset tonight, Blore. Of course, you leave this day month. I, I... Looking round. Blore, he's gone. If I don't call him back, the spire may be richer tomorrow by five hundred pounds. I won't dwell on it. I'll read. I'll read. Snatches a book at haphazard from the bookshelf. There is the sound of falling rain and distant thunder. Rain. Thunder. How it assimilates with the tempest of my mind. I'll read. Bless me. This is very strange. Reading. The Horse and Its Ailments by John Cox, MRCVS. It was with the aid of this volume that I used to doctor my poor old mare at Oxford. A leaf turned down. Reading. Simple remedies for chills. The bolus. The helpless beast in my stable is suffering from a chill. Good gracious, if I allow Blore to risk my fifty pounds on Dandy Dick, surely it would be advisable to administer this bolus to the poor animal without delay. Referring to the book hastily. I have these drugs in my chest. There's not a moment to be lost. Going to the bell and ringing. I shall want help. I'll fetch my medicine chest. He lays the book upon the table and goes into the library. Blore enters. Blore, looking round. Where is he? The bell rang. The dean's puzzling me with his uncommon behaviour, that is. The dean comes from the library, carrying a large medicine chest. On encountering Blore, he starts and turns away his head, the picture of guilt. Blore, I feel it would be a humane act to administer to the poor ignorant animal in my stable a simple bolus as a precaution against chill. I rely upon your aid and discretion in ministering to any guest in the deanery. Blore, in a whisper. I see, sir. You ain't going to lose half a chance for tomorrow, sir. You're a known one, sir, as the saying goes. The dean, shrinking from Blore with a groan. Oh! He places the medicine chest on the table and takes up the book, handing the book to Blore with his finger on a page. Fetch these humble but necessary articles from the kitchen, quick. I'll mix the bolus here. Blore goes out quickly. It is exactly seven and twenty years since I last approached a horse medically. He takes off his coat and lays it on a chair, then rolls his shirt sleeves up above his elbows and puts on his glasses. I trust this bolus will not give the animal an unfair advantage over his competitors. I don't desire that. I don't desire that. Blore re-enters, carrying a tray on which are a small flour barrel and rolling pin, a white china basin, a carafe of water, a napkin, and a book. The dean recoils, then guiltily takes the tray from Lore and puts it on the table. Thank you. Blore, holding on to the window curtain and watching the dean. His eyes is awful. I don't seem to know of a happy deanery when I see such proceedings a going on at the dead of night. There is a heavy roll of thunder, the dean mixes a pudding and stirs it with the rolling pin. The old, half-forgotten time returns to me. I am once again a promising youth at college. Blore to himself. One would think by his looks that he was going to poison his family instead of... Poison. Poison. Oh, if anything serious happened to the animal in our stable, there would be nothing in the way of Bonnie Betsy... The deserving horse I've trusted with my ardour and savings. I am walking once again in the old streets of Oxford, avoiding the shops where I owe my youthful bills. Bills! He pounds away vigorously with the rolling pin. Blore to himself. Where's the stuff I got a month ago to destroy the whole black retriever that fell ill? Bills! The dog died. The poison's in my pantry. It couldn't have got used for cooking purposes. I see the broad meadows and the tall spire of the college. 
the spire. Oh, my whole life seems made up of bills and spires. Bloor, to himself. I'll do it. I'll do it. Unseen by the dean, he quickly and quietly steals out by the door. Where are the drugs? The drugs! Opening the medicine chest and bending down over the bottles, he pours some drops from a bottle into the basin. Counting. Three, four, five, six. He replaces the bottle and takes another. How fortunate some animals are. Counting. One, two, three, four. It's done. Taking up the medicine chest, he goes with it into the library. As he disappears, Bloor re-enters stealthily, fingering a small paper packet. Bloor, in a whisper. Strychnine. There's a heavy roll of thunder. Bloor darts to the table, empties the contents of the packet into the basin, and stirs vigorously with the rolling pin. Oh, I've cooked Dandy Dick. Oh, I've cooked Dandy Dick. He moves from the table in horror. Oh, I'm only an amateur sportsman, and I can't afford uncertainty. As the dean returns, Bloor starts up guiltily. Can I help you any more, sir? No, remove these dreadful things. And don't let me see you again tonight. Sits with the basin on his knees and proceeds to roll the paste. Bloor, removing the tray. It's only an horse. It's only an horse. But after tomorrow I'll retire from the turf, if only to reclaim him. He goes out. The dean, putting on his coat. I don't contemplate my humane task with resignation. The stable is small, and if the animal is restive, we shall be cramped for room. The rain is heard. I shall get a chill, too. Seeing Sir Tristram's coat and cap lying upon the settee, I am sure Marden will lend me this gladly. Putting on the coat, which completely envelops him, The animal may recognize the garment, and receive me with kindly feelings. Putting on the sealskin cap, which almost conceals his face, Ugh! Why do I feel this dreadful sinking at the heart? Taking the basin and turning out the lamp. Oh, if all followers of the veterinary science are as truly wretched as I am, what a noble band they must be. The thunder rolls as he goes through the window curtains. Sir Tristram then enters quietly, smoking and carrying a lighted candle. All right, fire still burning? Blowing out the candle. I shall doze here till daybreak. What a night! I never thought there was so much thunder in these small country places. Georgiana, looking pale and agitated, and wearing a dressing gown, enters quickly, carrying an umbrella and the lighted candle. Which is the nearer way to the stable? I must satisfy myself. I must. I must. Going to the door. Sir Tristram, rising suddenly. Hello? <gasps> Hush! Georgiana, holding out her umbrella. Stand where you are, or I'll fire. Recognizing Sir Tristram. <sighs> Tris. Why, George? Oh, Tris, I've been dreaming. Falling helplessly against Sir Tristram, who deposits her in a chair. Oh, 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 don't look at me. I'm overtrained. I shall be on my legs again in a minute. <sighs> she opens her umbrella and hides herself behind it, sobbing violently. Sir Tristram, standing over the umbrella in great concern. My goodness! George, whatever shall I do? Shall I trot you up and down outside? <sighs> be quiet. What are you fooling about here for? Why can't you lie quietly in your cot? Confound that cot! Why, it wouldn't hold my photograph! Where are you going? Into the stable, to sit with Dandy. The thunder's awful in my room. When it gets tired, it seems to sit down on my particular bit of roof. I did doze once, and then I had a frightful dream. I dreamt that Dandy had sold himself to a circus, and that they were hooting him because he had lost his tail. 
there's an omen don't don't be a man george be a man georgiana shutting her umbrella i know i'm dreadfully effeminate there tids himself again bravo ah tris don't think me soft old man i'm a lonely unlucky woman and the tail end of this horse is all that's left me in the world to love and to cling to no by jove i'm not such a mean cur as that swap halves and take his head george my boy oh not i i'm like a doting mother to my share of dandy and it's all the dearer because it's an invalid i'm off come along turning towards the window she following him he suddenly stops and looks at her and seizes her hand george i never guessed that you were so tender-hearted well i'm not and you've robbed me tonight of an old friend a pal i what do you mean i mean that i seem to have dropped the acquaintance of george tid Squire forever tris no i have but i've got an introduction to his twin sister georgiana georgiana snatching her hand away angrily stay where you are i'll nurse my half alone she goes towards the window then starts back hush what's the matter didn't you hear something where georgiana pointing to the window there sir tristram peeping through the curtains you're right some people moving about the garden tris the horse they're not near the stables they're coming in here hush we'll clear out and watch sir tristram takes the candlestick and they go out leaving the room in darkness the curtains at the window are pushed aside and salome and sheba enter both in their fancy dresses salome in a rage lighting the candles on the mantelpiece oh 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 no ball after all if we only had a brother to avenge us i shall try and borrow a brother tomorrow cold wretched splashed in debt for nothing to think that we've had all the inconvenience of being wicked and rebellious and have only half done it this comes of stooping to the military it serves us right we've been trained for clergymen's wives i hate nugent darby i hope he may grow bald early general tarver's nose is inclined to pink may it deepen and deepen till it frightens cows voices are heard from the curtained window recess darby outside miss jed sheba tava outside pray here to wretched men miss jed salome in a whisper there they are shall we grant them a dignified interview yes curl your lip sheba you curl your lip better than i i'll dilate my nostrils salome draws aside the curtain tava and darby enter they are both very badly and shabbily dressed as cavaliers tava a most miserable object carrying a carriage umbrella oh don't reproach us miss jid it isn't our fault that the military was summoned to st marvel's you don't blame officers and gentlemen for responding to the sacred call of duty we blame officers for subjecting two motherless girls to the shock of alighting at the durnstone athenium to find a notice on the front door ball knocked on the head viva regina we blame gentlemen for inflicting upon us the unspeakable agony of being jeered at by boys i took the address of the boy who suggested that we should call again on the fifth of november it's on the back of your admission card everything will be done we shall both wait on the boy's mother for an explanation oh smile on us once again miss jed a forced hollow smile if you will only smile slow me georgiana enters salome sheba aunt you bad girls salome weeping no aunt no not bad aunt trustful and confiding georgiana advancing to tava how dare you encourage these two simple children to enjoy themselves 
how dare you take them out without their aunt do you think i can't keep a thing quiet they didn't even ask papa's permission poor papa poor dear papa georgiana shaking tava i'm speaking to you field marshal madam you are addressing an invalid we shall be happy to receive your representative in the morning at present we are on duty on heavy duty guarding the ruins of the swan inn you mustn't distract our attention guarding the ruins of the swan are you calling tris sir tristram sir tristram appears tris i'm a feeble woman but i hope i have a keen sense of right and wrong run these outsiders into the road and let them guard their own ruins salome and sheba shriek and throw themselves at the feet of tava and darby clinging to their legs ah no no spare him you shall not harm a hair of their heads sir tristram twists tava's wig round so that it covers his face the gate bell is heard ringing violently what's, what's that? that it will wake papa stop the bell georgiana runs to the door and opens it salome to tava and darby fly tava and darby disappear through the curtains at the window sheba falling into salome's arms we have saved them oh tris your man from the stable hatcham georgiana calling hatcham hatcham carrying the basin with the bolus runs in breathlessly followed by blore oh sir tristram what, what is, is it? it the villain that set fire to the swan sir in the act of administering a dose to the oars ah nobbling our dandy where is the scoundrel topping the constable's collared him sir he's taken him in a cart to the lock-up oh blore in agony they've got the dean end of the second act act three of dandy dick by arthur wing Pinero. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Act Three, the next day, Scene One, the strong box, St. Marvel's. Scene Two, the deanery again. The curtain will be lowered for a few minutes between the two scenes. The first scene is the interior of a country police station, a quaint old room with plaster walls, oaken beams, and a gothic mullioned window looking onto the street. A massive door with a small sliding wicket and an iron grating opens to a prisoner's cell the room is partly furnished as a kitchen partly as a police station a copy of the police regulations and other official documents and implements hanging on the wall it is the morning after the events of the previous act hannah a buxom fresh-looking young woman in a print gown has been engaged in cooking while singing gaily opening a door and calling with a slight dialect noah darling noah from another room in a rough country voice yes you'll have your dinner before you drive your prisoner over to durnston won't you darling yes hannah closing the door yes noah's in a nice temper today over summit oh well i suppose all public characters is liable to irritation there is a knock at the outer door hannah opening it sees blore with a troubled look on his face well ah never mr blore from the deanery come in you might knock me down with her blore entering and shaking hands mournfully how do you do mrs topping and how is the dear dean bless him the sweetest soul in the world blore to himself good gracious she doesn't know of our misfortune to hannah i uh i haven't seen him this morning well this is real kind of you calling on an old friend edward when i think that i were cook at the deanery seven years and that since i left you to get wedded not a soul of you has been near me it do seem hard 
Well, you see, um, the kitchen took umbrage at your marrying a policeman at Durnston. It was regarded as a mesilliance. Well, now, Mr. Topping's got the appointment of head constable at St. Marvel's. What's that regarded as? A rise on the scales, Hannah. A decided rise. But still, you've only been a week in St. Marvel's, and you've got to fight your way up. I think I'm as hop as ever I'm like to be. However, Jane and Sarah and Willis, the stable boy, have humbent so far as to ask me to leave their cards, knowing I was a calling. He produces from an old leather pocket book three very dirty pieces of pasteboard, which he gives to Hannah. Hannah, taking them in her apron with pride. Thank him kindly. When's their evening? We receive on Tuesdays at the side gate. And how are you, my dear? Kissing her cheek. Don't, Edward Blore. Don't? When you was Miss Heavens, there wasn't these social barriers, Anna? Shut up. Noah's jealous of the very apron strings what go round my waist. I'm not so free and andy with my kisses now, I can tell you. Then what is friendship but a name? But Mr. Toppin isn't indoors now, surely. Hannah, nodding her head. Uh? Why, he took a man up last night. What of it? Why, uh, I thought that when Hinny arrest was made in St. Marvel's, the prisoner was lodged here only for the night, and that the Ed Constable had to drive him over to Durnston Police Station the first thing in the morning. That's the rule, but Noah's behind hand today and ain't going into Durnston till after dinner. Then the prisoner is on the premises. Yes, he's in our cell. Oh, and where is the apartment in question? The cell? That's it. Blore, looking round in horror. Oh! The strong box, they call it in St. Marvel's. Oh my goodness, holy fancy whimpering to himself. And him accustomed to his shaving water at eight, and my kindly hint to button his gaiters. Oh, here's a warning. Whatever is the matter with you, Edward? Anna, Anna, my dear, it's this very prisoner what I have called on you respecting. Oh, then the honour ain't a compliment to me after all, Mr. Blore. I'm killing two birds with one stone, my dear. Hannah, throwing the cards into Blore's head. You can take them back to the deanery with Mrs. Topping's comps. Blore, shaking the cards out of his head and replacing them in his pocket book. I will leave them on you again tomorrow, Anna. But, Anna, dearie, do you know that this unfortunate man was stuck in our stables last night? No, I never ask no one nothing about Queen's business. He don't want two women over him. Then you haven't seen the miserable culprit? Law, no. I was in bed hours when Noah brought him home. I take no interest in it all. They tell us it's only a wretched poacher or a petty larcery will get in St. Marvel's. My poor Noah ain't never likely to have the chance of a horrid murder in a place what returns a conservative. Ah, my joint's burning. Kneeling to look into the oven. But, Anna, suppose this case you got hold of now is a case what will shake old England to its basis. Suppose it means columns in the paper with Toppin's name a figuring. Suppose this family reading it old its own with divorce cases. Hello, you know something about this arrest, you do. No, no, I don't. I merely said suppose. I merely wish to encourage you, Anna, to implant and hope that crime may brighten your wedded life. Hannah, sitting at the table and referring to an official book. The man was found trespassing in the deanery stables with intent. Refuses to give his name or any account of his self. Blor, to himself. If I could only find out where the dandy dick had any of the medicine, it would so guard me at the races. What am I to do? It doesn't appear that the horse in the stables took it, does it? Henna, looking up sharply. Took what? Uh, took fright. 
You're sure there's no confession of any sort, Anna, dear? As he is bending over Hannah, Noah Topping appears. Noah is a dense-looking, ugly countryman, with red hair, a bristling beard, and a vindictive leer. He's dressed in ill-fitting clothes, as a rural police constable. Noah, fiercely. Anna! Hannah, starting and replacing the book. Oh, don't! This is Mr. Blore from the deanery come to see us. An old friend of mine. Blore advances to Noah with a nervous smile, extending his hand. Noah, taking Blore's hand and holding it firmly. A friend of Ern is a friend of mine. I hope so, Mr. Topping. I thank you. She's getting me a lot of nice new friends this week, since we come to St. Marvel's. Of course, dear Anna was a love and favour with everybody. Ah, well then, as her friends be mine, I'm taking the liberty, one by one, of gradually dropping on them all. Blore, getting his hand away. Dear me. And if I catch any old fly buzzing around my lady, I'll venture to break his head with my staff. Oh, Noah. Blore, preparing to depart. I, uh, I merely called to know if anything had been found out about the ruffian took in our stables last night. Is that your business? It's, uh, it's my master's business. He's the Deanne, isn't he? Yes, Noah, of course. Noah, fiercely. Shut up, darling. Very well, then. Give Mr. Topping's respects to the Dean, and say I'll run up to the deanery and see him after I've took my man over to Durnston. Thank you. I hope the Dean will be at home. Good day, Anna. Good day, Mr. Topping. Offering his hand, into which Noah significantly places his truncheon, Blor goes out quickly. Hannah, whimpering. Oh, Noah, Noah, I don't believe as we shall ever get a large circle of friends round us. Now then. Selecting a pair of handcuffs and examining them critically. Them will do. Slipping them into his pocket and turning upon Hannah suddenly. Anna? Yes, Nori? Brighten up, me darling. The little time you have me at home with you. Yes, Nori. She bustles about and begins to lay the cloth. I'm just a going round to the stable to put old Nick in the cart. Oh, don't you trust to Nick, Noah, dear? He's such a vicious brute. Kitty's he safer in the cart? Shut up, darling. Nick can take me onto the edge of the hill in half the time. The hill? Oh, what do you think I've put off taking my man to Durnston to now for? Why, I'm a going to get a glimpse of the racing on me way over. Opening the wicket in the cell door and looking in. There he is, sulky. To Henna. Open the hoven door, Anna, and let the smell of the cooking get into him. Oh no, Noah, it's torture. Do as I tell ye. She opens the oven door. Torture? Of course it's torture. That's my rule. Whenever I get a hold of a darned obstinate creature what won't reveal his identity, I opens the oven door. He goes out into the street, and as he departs, the woeful face of the dean appears at the wicket, his head being still enveloped in the fur cap. Hannah shutting the oven door. Not me. Torturing prisoners might have done for the Middle Ages what Noah's always clattering about, but not for my time of life. I'll shut that wicket. Crossing close to the wicket, her face almost comes against the Dean's. She gives a cry. Ah, <gasps> The Dean! Oh! He disappears. Oh, no, not my old master, never the master! Tottering to the wicket and looking in, Master, look at me. It's Hannah, your poor faithful servant. Hannah. The face of the dean reappears. Hannah Evans. It's Hannah Topping, Nee Evans, wife of the constable what's going to Turkey to cruel Durnstone. 
sinking weeping upon the ground at the door oh mr dean sir what have you been up to what have you been up to what have you been up to woman i am the victim of a misfortune only partially merited hannah on her knees clasping her hands tell me what you've done master dear give it a name for the love of goodness my poor hannah i fear i have placed myself in an equivocal position ah! be quiet woman is it a change of cooking that's brought you to such ways i cooked for you for seven happy years the dean sniffing alas you seem to have lost none of your culinary skill master are you hungry i am sorely tried by your domestic preparations Hena with clenched hands and a determined look oh quickly locking and bolting the street door no i can't put that brute of a horse to under ten minutes the duplicate key or the strong box producing a large key with which she unlocks the cell door master you'll give me your patrol knot to cut won't you under any other circumstances hannah i should resent that insinuation don't resent nothing shove shove your hardest dean dear pulling the door which opens sufficiently to let out the dean the dean as he enters the room good day hannah you have bettered yourself i hope hannah hysterically flinging herself upon the dean oh master master the dean putting her from him sternly hannah mrs topping oh ah no ah no but crime levels all dear sir you appear to misapprehend the precise degree of criminality which attaches to me mrs topping in the eyes of that majestic but imperfect instrument the law i am an innocent if not an injured man ah stick to that sir stick to it if you think it's likely to serve your wicked ends placing bread with other things on the table my good woman a single word from me to those at the deanery would instantly restore me to home family and accustomed diet ah they all tell that tale what comes here why don't you send word dean dear because it would involve revelations of my temporary moral aberration Hena, putting her apron to her eyes with a howl oh because i should return to the deanery with my dignity that priceless possession of a man's middle age with my dignity seriously impaired oh don't sir don't how could i face my simple children who have hitherto not unreasonably regarded me as faultless how could i again walk erect in the streets of st marvel's with my name blazoned on the records of a police station of the very humblest description sinking into a chair and snatching up a piece of bread which he begins munching Hena, wiping her eyes oh sir it's a treat to hear you compared with the ordinary criminal class but master dear though i know i don't recognize you through his being a stranger to st marvel's how'll you fare when you get to durnstone i have one great buoyant hope that a word in the ear of the durnstone superintendent will send me forth an unquestioned man you and he will be the sole keepers of my precious secret may its possession be a lasting comfort to you both master is what you've told me your only chance of getting off unknown it is the sole remaining chance of averting a calamity of almost national importance then you're as done as that joint in my oven woman the superintendent at durnstone john ruggles also the two inspectors whittaker and parker well them and their wives and families are chapel folk no yes the dean totters across to a chair into which he sinks with his head upon the table master listen it's all over it's all over no no listen i was well fed and kept seven years at the deanery i've been wed to know at topping eight weeks that's six years and ten months loving duty due to you and yours before i owe nothing to my darling noah master dear you shan't be took to durnstone silence hannah topping formerly evans 
it is my duty to inform you that your reasoning does more credit to your heart than to your head i can't help that the devil's always in a woman's heart because it's the warmest place to get to taking a small key from the table drawer here take that pushing the key into the pocket of his coat when you once get free from my darling noah that key unlocks your handcuffs handcuffs how are you to get free that's the question now isn't it i'll tell you my noah drives you over to durnstone with old nick in the cart old nick that's the horse now nick was formerly in the durnstone fire brigade and when he hears the familiar signal of a double whistle you can't hold him in there's the whistle putting it into the dean's pocket directly you turn into pear tree lane blow once and you'll see noah with his nose in the air pulling to wrench his hands off jump out roll clear of the wheel keep cool and hopeful and blow again before you can get the mud out of your eyes noah and the horse and cart will be well into durnstone and may providence restore a young husband safe to his doting wife hannah how dare you recoiling horror-stricken hannah crying oh, oh, oh. is this the fruit of your seven years constant cookery at the deanery oh dear i wouldn't have done it only this is your first offence my first offence oh you're not too old i want to give you another start in life another start woman do you think i've no conscience do you think i don't realize the enormity of the of the difficulties in alighting from a vehicle in rapid motion henna opening the oven and taking out a small joint in a baking tin which she places on the table it's anger what makes you feel conscientious the dean waving her away i have done with you with me sir but not with the joint you will feel wickeder when you've had a little nourishment he looks hungrily at the dish that's right dean dear taste my darling noah's favorite dish the dean advancing towards the table oh hannah topping hannah topping clutching the carving knife despairingly i have no more woman cooks the deanery this reads me a lesson sitting and carving with desperation don't stint yourself sir you can't blow that whistle on an empty frame the dean begins to eat don't my cooking carry you back sir oh say it do ah oh, if every mouthful would carry me back one little hour i would finish this joint noah topping unperceived by hannah and the dean climbs in by the window his eyes bolting with rage he glares around the room taking in everything at a glance noah under his breath my man of mystery a waited on by my newly made wife and a heating o my favourite meal touching hannah on the arm she turns and faces him speechless with fright the dean still eating if my mind were calmer this would be an all-sufficient repast hannah tries to speak then clasps her hands and sinks on her knees to noah hannah a little plain cold water in a simple tumbler please noah grimly folding his arms anna introduce me anna gives a cry and clings to noah's legs the dean calmly to noah am i to gather constable from your respective attitudes that you object to these little kindnesses extended to me by your worthy wife i'm wishing to know the name of my worthy wife's friend a friend of ern is a friend of mine no re no re she's getting me a lot of nice new friends since we come to st marvel's no re i made this gentleman's acquaintance through the wicked in a casual way ay cooks and railings cooks and railings i might have guessed my wedded life had come to this he spoke to me just as a strange gentleman ought to speak to a lady didn't you sir didn't you hannah do not let us even under these circumstances prevaricate 
such is not quite the case noah advances savagely to the dean there is a knocking at the door noah restrains himself and faces the dean no this is neither the time nor the place we people at the door and dinner on the table to spill a strange man's blood i trust that your self-respect as an officer of the law will avert anything so unseemly ay that's it you touch me on my point of pride there ain't another police station in all durnston conducted more strict and rigid nor what mine is and it shall so continue you and me is a-goin to set out for durnston and when the charges now standing against you is entered it is i noah atop him while add another there is another knock at the door noah the charge of alienating the affections of my wife anna no no i am worse the embezzling of my midday meal prepared by her hands points into the cell go in you have five minutes more in the home you have ruined and laid waste the dean going to the door and turning to noah you will at least receive my earnest assurance that this worthy woman is extremely innocent innocent points to the joint on the table look there the dean much overcome disappears through the cell door which noah closes and locks the knock at the door is repeated to hannah pointing to the outer door unlock that door oh no re you'll never be popular in st marvel's unlock that door hannah unlocks the door and admits georgiana and sir tristram both dressed for the race course dear me is this the police station yes lady take a chair lady near the fire to sir tristram sit down sir this is my first visit to a police station my good woman i hope it will be the last oh don't say that ma'am we're only auxiliary ear ma'am the bench sets at durnstone i must say you try to make everybody feel at home Hannah curtsies. It's beautifully Arcadian. Georgiana to Hannah. Perhaps this is only a police station for the young. No, ma'am, we take ladies and gentlemen like yourselves. Noah, who has not been noticed, surveying Georgiana and Sir Tristram gloomily. Anna, introduce me. Georgiana, facing Noah. Good gracious! What's that? Oh, good morning. Anna's a getting a lot of nice new friends this week since we come to St. Marvel's. Noah, Noah, the lady and gentleman is strange. Oh. Are you the man in charge here? Aye. Are you seeing me on business or pleasure? Do you imagine people come here to see you? No, they generally come to see my wife. However, if it is business... Pointing to the other side of the room. That's the official side. This is domestic. You'll all kindly move over. Oh, oh certainly. certainly. Changing their seats. Now look here, my man. This lady is Mrs. Tidman. Mrs. Tidman is the sister of Dr. Jed the dean of st marvels oh there's something wrong with your wife i she's profligate proceedings are pending georgiana to sir tristram strange police station my flesh creeps sir tristram to noah well my good man to come to the point my poor friend and this lady's brother Dr. Jed, the dean, you know, has mysteriously and unaccountably disappeared. Vanished. Gone. Absconded. Absconded? How dare you? Respectable man, was he? What do you mean? This lady is his sister. 
Now look here, it's no good of getting nasty and irritable with the law. I'll come over to ye officially. Putting the baking tin under his arm, he crosses over to Sir Tristram and Georgiana. Sir Tristram, putting his handkerchief to his face. Don't bring that horrible odour of cooking over here. Oh, take it away. What is it? It's evidence against my profligate wife. Sir Tristram and Georgiana exchange looks of impatience. Do you realise that my poor brother, the Dean, is missing? Aye. Touching this missing Dean. I left him last night to retire to rest. This morning he's not to be found. Aye. Has it struck you to look in his bed? Of, of course. course. Everybody did, Dad. One would have done. It's only confusing Hall doing it. Money matters, right or wrong. Georgiana puts her handkerchief to her eyes. Do put your questions more feelingly. This is his sister. I am his friend. You will push yourself forward. Had he anything on his mind? Yes. Then I've got a theory. What, what is, is it? it? A theory that will put you all out of suspense. Yes, yes. yes. I've been a good bit about. I read a deal, and I'm a shrewd, experienced man. I should say there is nothing but a ordinary case of suicide. Georgiana sits faintly. Sir Tristram, savagely to Noah. Get out of the way. Georgiana! Oh, Tris. If this were true, how could we break it to the girls? I could run up during the evening and break it to the girls. Sir Tristram turns upon Noah. Look here, all you've got to do is hold your tongue and take down my description of the Dean and report his disappearance to Dunstone. Pushing him into a chair. Go on. Dictating. Missing. The very reverend Augustine Jed, Dean of St. Marvels. Poor Gus. Poor Gus. Hannah, softly to Georgiana. Lady. Lady. Noah prepares to write, depositing the baking tin on the table. Georgiana, turning. Eh? Hush. Listen to me. Speaks to Georgiana excitedly. Sir Tristram to Noah. Have you got that? Noah, writing laboriously, with his legs curled around the chair and his head on the table. I, I'm spelling it my own way. Oh, dear old Gus. Dictating. Description. Oh, no. Description. I suppose he was just a ordinary sort of looking man. No, no, description! Georgiana turning from Hannah excitedly. Description. A little, short, thin man with black hair and a squint. Sir Tristram to Georgiana. No, no, he isn't. Yes, he is. Georgiana, what are you talking about? I'm Gus's sister. I ought to know what he's like. Good heavens, Georgiana! Your mind is not going. Georgiana, clutching Sir Tristram's arm and whispering in his ear as she points to the cell door. He's in there. Eh? Hey. Gus is the villain found dozing Dandy Dick last night. Sir Tristram, falling back. Oh. Hannah seizes Sir Tristram and talks to him rapidly. To Noah. What have you written? I've written... Answers to the name of Gus. Georgiana, snatching the paper from him. It's not wanted. I've altered my mind. I'm too busy to bother about him this week. What? After wasting my time? Look here. You're the constable who took the man in the deanery stables last night. Aye. Looking out of the window. There's my car outside, ready to take the scoundrel over to Durnston. I should like to see him. You can view him passing out. He tucks the baking tin under his arm 
and goes up to the cell door georgiana to herself oh gus gus noah unlocking the door i warn yer he's an awful looking creature i can't stand it i love horrors noah goes into the cell closing the door after him tris georgiana what was my brother's motive in bolusing dandy last night i can't think the first thing to do is get him out of this hole this good woman has arranged his escape but we can't trust to gus rolling out of a flying dog cart why it's as much as i could do oh yes lady he'll do it i've provided for everything don't betray him to noah there's another an awful a charge hanging over his reverend ed another charge another oh tris to think my own stock should run vicious like this hush lady noah comes out of the cell with the dean who is in handcuffs oh, oh. the dean raising his eyes sees sir tristram and georgiana and recoils with a groan sinking onto a chair oh oh you get no no stay i am the owner of the horse stabled at the deanery i make no charge against this wretched person to the dean oh man man i was discovered administering to a suffering beast a simple remedy for chills i am an unfortunate creature do with me what you will the analysis hasn't come home from the chemists yet is this the truth yes sir tristram to noah release this man release him he was found trespassing in the stables of the late diane who has committed suicide oh i hush the diseased diane is the only man what can withdraw one charge i listen hush, hush and i'm the only man what can withdraw the other you get out get out i charge this person unknown with alienating the affections of my wife while i was putting my horse to and i'm going to drive him over to durnston with the evidence oh lady lady it's appearances what is against us noah through the opening of the door whoa steady there get back georgiana whispering to the dean i am disappointed in you augustine have you got this wretched woman's whistle yes sir tristram softly to the dean oh jed jed um these are what you call principles have you got the key of your handcuffs yes noah appearing in the doorway time's up come on may i say a few parting words in the home i have apparently wrecked say em and have done in setting out upon a journey the termination of which is problematical i desire to attest that this erring constable is the husband of a wife from whom it is impossible to withhold respect if not admiration you hear him as for my wretched self the confession of my weaknesses must be reserved for another time another place to georgiana to you whose privilege it is to shelter in the sanctity of the deanery i give this earnest admonition within an hour from this terrible moment let the fire be lighted in the drawing-room let the missing man's warm bath be waiting for its master a change of linen prepared withhold your judgments wait this is none of your business come on i am ready noah takes him by the arm and leads him out oh what am i to think of my brother hannah kneeling at georgiana's feet think that he's the beautifulest sweetest man in all dernshire woman it's i and my whistle and nick the fire brigade horse will bring him back to the deanery safe and unharmed not a soul but we three'll ever know of his misfortune listening hark they're off 
Noah outside. Get up now. Get up, old girl. Hannah, rushing to the door and looking out. Ah, oh, he's done for. Done, done for. for? The dean can whistle himself blue. Noah's put Kitty in the cart and left old Nick at home. The end of the first scene. The second scene is in the morning room at the deanery again. Salome and Sheba are sitting there gloomily. Poor papa. Poor dear papa. He must return very soon. He must. He must. In the meantime, it is such a comfort to feel that we have no cause for self-reproach. But the anxiety is terribly wearing. Nothing is so weakening, Salome. Sheba, dear. Sheba, clinging to Salome. If I should pine and ultimately die of the suspense, I want you to have my workbox. Salome, shaking her head and sadly turning away. Thank you, dear. But if Papa is not home for afternoon tea, you will outlive me. Turning towards the window as Major Tarver and Mr. Darby appear outside. Miss Jed, Miss Jed. Sheba, here are Gerald Tarver and Mr. Darby. Oh, the presumption. Open the window and dare them to enter. Salome unfastens the window. Thank you. Don't be shocked when you see Tarver. Tarver and Darby enter, dressed for the races, but Darby is supporting Tarver, who looks extremely weakly. Pardon this informal method of presenting ourselves. You do well, gentlemen, to intrude upon two feeble women at a moment of sorrow. One step further, and I shall ask Major Tarver, who is nearest the bell, to ring for help. Tarver sinks into a chair. Darby, standing by the side of Tarver. There now. Fact is, Miss Jed, that Tarver is in an exceedingly critical condition. Feeling that he has incurred your displeasure, he has failed even in the struggle to gain the race course. I have taken him to Dr. Middleton, and I explained that Major Tarver loved with a passion looking at Chiba, second only to my own. Salome, sitting comfortably on the settee. Oh, we cannot listen to you, Mr. Darby. Go on, sir, if you can. The two girls exchange looks. The doctor made a searching examination of the major's tongue and diagnosed that, unless the major at once proposed to the lady in question and was accepted, Three weeks or a month at the seaside would be absolutely imperative. Shall I continue? Oh, certainly. I am helpless. We are curious to see to what lengths you will go. The pitiable condition of my poor friend speaks for itself. I beg your pardon. It does nothing of the kind. Tava, rising with difficulty and approaching Salome. Salome, I have loved you distractedly. For upwards of eight weeks. Salome, going to him. Oh, Major Tarver, let me pass. Holding his coat firmly. Let me pass, I say. Unless you push me, never. Spare me this scene, Mr. Darby. Darby follows Sheba across the room. To a man in my condition, love is either a rapid and fatal melody, or it is an admirable digestive. Except me and my merry laugh once more rings through the mess-room. Reject me, and my collection of vocal music, loose and in volumes, will be brought to the hammer, and the bird, as it were, will trill no more. And is it really I who would hush the little throaty songster? Certainly. Taking a sheet of paper from his pocket. I have the doctor's certificate to that effect. Both reading the certificate... They walk into the library. Oh, Mr. Darby, I have never thought of marriage seriously. People never do till they are married. But think, only think of my age. Pardon me, Sheba, but what is your age? Oh, it is so very little. It is not worth mentioning. Cannot we remain friends and occasionally correspond? Well, of course, if you insist. No, no, I see that it is impracticable. It must be wed or part. All I ask is time. Time to ponder over such a question. Time to know myself better. Certainly. How long? 
Give me two or three minutes. Hush. They separate as Tava and Salome re-enter the room. Tava is glaring excitedly and biting his nails. I never thought I should live to be accepted by anyone. I shall buy some gay songs. Hey, when can I see the dean? Oh, don't. Salome? Papa has been out all night. All, all night? night? Isn't it terrible? Oh, what do you think of it, Mr. Darby? Shocking, but we oughtn't to condemn him unheard. Condemn my papa? Sheba at the window. Here's Aunt Georgiana. Hey, look out, Tarver. Going out quickly. Salome pulling Tarver after her. Come this way, and let us take cuttings in the conservatory. They go out. Mr. Darby, Mr. Darby, wait for me. I have decided. Yes. She goes out by the door as Georgiana enters excitedly at the window. Georgiana, waving her handkerchief. Come on, Tris. The course is clear. Mind the gatepost. Hold him up. Now, give him his head. Sir Tristram and Hatcham enter by the window, carrying the dean. They all look as though they have been recently engaged in a prolonged struggle. Put him down! Put him down. That I will, ma'am, and gladly. They deposit the dean in a chair, and Georgiana and Sir Tristram each seize a hand, feeling the dean's pulse, while Hatcham puts his hand on the dean's heart. The dean, opening his eyes. Where am I now? He lives! Hurrah! Cheer, man, cheer! Sir Tristram and Hatcham, quietly. Hurrah! To Hatcham. We can't shout here. Go and cheer as loudly as you can in the roadway by yourself. Yes, sir. Hatcham runs out at the window. The dean, gradually recovering. Georgiana, Martin. How are you, Jed, old boy? How do you feel now, Gus? Torn to fragments. So you are. Thank heaven he's conscious. I feel as if I had been walked over carefully by a large concourse of the lower orders. <laughs> so you have been. Thank heaven, his memory is all right. Hatcham's voice is heard in the distance, cheering. They all listen. That's Hatcham. I'll raise his wages. Do I understand that I have been forcibly and illegally rescued? That's it, old fellow. Who has committed such a reprehensible act? A woman who would have been a heroine to any age. Georgiana. Georgiana, I am bound to overlook it in a relative, but never let this occur again. Tell him. You found out that that other woman's plan went lame, didn't you? I discovered its inefficacy after a prolonged period of ineffectual whistling. But we ascertained the road the genial constable was going to follow. He was bound for the edge of the hill, up Pear Tree Lane, to watch the races. Directly we knew this, Tris and I made for the hill. Bless your soul, there were hundreds of my old friends there. Welchers, pickpockets, car choppers, all the lowest race court cads in the kingdom. In a minute I was in the middle of them, as much as home as a duchess in a drawing room. A queen in a palace. Bodicea among the druids. Do you know me? I hallowed out. Instantly there was a cry of, Blessed if it ain't George Tidd. Tears of real joy sprang to my eyes. While I was wiping them away, Triss had his pockets emptied, and I lost my watch. Ah, Jed, it was a glorious moment. Triss made a back, and I stood on it, supported by a correct card merchant on either side. Dear friends, I said, brothers, I'm with you once again. You should have heard the shouts of honest welcome. Before I could obtain silence, my field glasses had gone on their long journey. Listen to me, I said. A very dear relative of mine has been collared for playing the three-card trick on his way down from town. There was a groan of sympathy. He'll be on the brow of the hill with a bobby in half an hour, said I. Who's for the rescue? A dead, deep silence followed, broken only by the sweet voice of a young child saying, What'll we get for it? A pound apiece, said I. There was a roar of assent, and my concluding words, and possibly six months, were never heard. At that moment, 
Tris's back could stand it no longer, and we came heavily to the ground together. <laughs> Seizing the dean by the hand and dragging him up, now you know whose hands have led you back to your own manger embracing him and oh brother confess isn't there something good and noble in true english sport after all every abused institution has its redeeming characteristic but whence is the money to come to reward these dreadful persons i cannot reasonably ask my girls to organize a bazaar or concert concert i'm a rich woman rich well i've cleared fifteen hundred over the handicap the dean recoiling no then the horse who enjoyed the shelter of the deanery last night damned it dick one in a common canter all the rest nowhere and bonny betsy walked in with the policeman the dean to himself five hundred pounds towards the spire five hundred oh where is blore with the good news look at him lively as a cricket sir tristram i am under the impression that your horse swallowed reluctantly a small portion of that bolus last night before i was surprised and removed by the by i am expecting the analysis of that concoction any minute spare yourself the trouble the secret is with me i seek no acknowledgment from either of you but in your moment of deplorable triumph remembered with gratitude the little volume of the horse and its ailments and the prosaic name of its humane author john cox he goes out to the library but oh tris marden what can i ever say to you anything you like except thank you don't stop me why you were the man who hauled augustine out of the cart by his legs oh but why mention such trifles they're not trifles and when his cap fell off it was you brave fellow that you are who pulled the horse's nose-bag over my brother's head so that he shouldn't be recognized my dear georgiana these are the common courtesies of everyday life they are acts which any true woman would esteem Gus won't readily forget the critical moment when all the cut chaff ran down the back of his neck, nor shall I. Nor shall I forget the way in which you gave Dandy his whisky out of a soda water bottle just before the race. Ah, oh, that's nothing. Any lady would do the same. Nothing. You look like the Florence Nightingale of the paddock. Oh, Georgiana. Why, why, why won't you marry me? Why? Why? Why, because you've only just asked me, Tris. Goes to him cordially. But when I touched your hand last night, you reared. Yes, Tris, old man, but love is founded on mutual esteem. Last night you hadn't put my brother's head in that nose bag. They go together to the fireplace, he with his arm round her waist. Sheba, looking in at the door. How annoying! There's Aunt and Sir Tristram in this room. Salome and Major Tarver are sitting on the hot pipes in the conservatory. Where am I and Mr. Darby to go? Papa, come back! She withdraws quickly as the dean enters through the library, carrying a paper in his hand. He has now resumed his normal appearance. Home! What sonorous music is in the world? Home, with the secret of my sad misfortune buried in the bosoms of a faithful few. Home, with my family influence intact. Home, with the scepter of my dignity still tight in my grasp. What is this I have picked up on the stairs? Reads with a horrified look as Hatcham enters at the window. Beg pardon, Sir Tristram. What is it? The chemist has just brought the analysis. Where is he? Sir Tristram and Georgiana go out at the window, following Hatcham. It is too horrible. Reading. Debtor to Louis Isaacs, costumier to the Queen, Bow Street. Total, forty pounds nineteen. There was a fancy masked ball at Dernston last night. Salome, Sheba, no, no! Salome and Sheba bounding in and rushing at the dean papa papa, papa! 
Our own papa. Pepsy. Salome seizes his hands, she by his coattails, and turn him round violently. Our parent returned. Pepsy, come back. Stop. Papa, why have you tortured us with anxiety? Where have you been, you naughty man? Before I answer a question, which, from a child to its parent, partakes of the unpardonable vice of curiosity, I demand an explanation of this disreputable document. Reading. Debtor to Louis Isaacs, costumier to the Queen. Oh! Sheba sits aghast on the table. Salome distractedly falls on the floor. I will not follow this legend in all its revolting intricacies. Suffice it, its moral is inculcated by the mournful total, forty pounds nineteen. Imps of deceit! Looking from one to the other. There was a ball at Dunstan last night. I know it. Spare us. You couldn't have been there, Papa. There? I trust I was better. That is, otherwise employed. Referring to the bill. Which of my hitherto trusted daughters was a lady? No, I will say a person, of the period of the French Revolution. Sheba points to Salome. And a flower girl of an unknown epoch? Salome points to Sheba. To your respective rooms. The girls cling together. Let your blinds be drawn. At seven, porridge will be brought to you. Papa! Go! Papsy! Go! Papa, we, poor girls as we are, can pay the bill. You cannot. Go! Through the kindness of our aunt. We have won fifty pounds. What? At the races. The dean, recoiling. You too? You too drawn into the vortex? Is there no conscience that is clear? Is there no guilelessness left in this house, with a possible exception of my own? Sheba, sobbing. We always knew a little more than you gave us credit for, Papa. The dean, handing Sheba the bill. Take this horrid thing. Never let it meet my eyes again. As for the scandalous costumes, they shall be raffled for in aid of local charities. Confidence, that precious pearl in the snug shell of domesticity, is at an end between us. I chastise you both by permanently withholding from you the reason of my absence from home last night. Go. The girls totter out as Sir Tristram enters quickly at the window, followed by Georgiana carrying the basin containing the bolus. Sir Tristram has an opened letter in his hand. Good heavens, Jed! The analysis has arrived! I am absolutely indifferent. Indifferent? indifferent? The dean to Georgiana. How dare you confront me without even the semblance of a blush? You, who have enabled my innocent babies, for the first time in their lives, to discharge one of their own accounts. There isn't a blush in our family. If there were, you'd want it. Sheba and Salome appear outside the window, looking in. Jed, you were once my friend, and you are to be my relative. The dean, looking at Georgiana. My sister? To Sir Tristram. I offer no opposition. But not even our approaching family tie prevents me designating you as one of the most atrocious conspirators known in the history of the turf. Conspirator? As the owner of one half of Dandy Dick, I denounce you. As the owner of the other half, I denounce you. You? Shiva and Salome enter and remain standing in the recess, listening. The chief ingredient of your infernal preparation is known. It contains nothing that I would not cheerfully administer to my own children. Oh! <gasps> I believe you! Pointing to the paper. Strychnine! Sixteen grains! Salome and Sheba, clinging to each other, terrified. Oh! Strychnine? Summon my devoted servant Blore, in whose presence the innocuous mixture was compounded. Georgiana rings the bell. The girls hide behind the window curtains. This analysis is simply the pardonable result of over-enthusiasm on the part of our local chemist. You're a disgrace to the pretty little police station where you slept last night. Blore enters and stands unnoticed. 
I will prove that in the deanery stables the common laws of hospitality have never been transgressed. Give me the bowl. Georgiana hands the dean the basin from the table. A simple remedy for a chill. Strychnine! Sixteen grains! I, myself, am suffering from the exposure of last night. Taking the remaining bolus and opening his mouth. Observe me. Blore, rushing forward, snatching the basin from the dean and sinking onto his knees. No, no, don't, don't. You won't hang the oldest servant in the dignity. Blore. I did it. I had an honest fancy for Bonnie Betsy, and I won't want this gentleman's horse out of the way. And while you was mixing the dose with the best ecclesiastical intentions, I introduced a foreign element. The dean, pulling Blore up by his coat collar. Viper! Oh, sir, it was all for the sake of the dean. The dean? The dear dean had only fifty pounds to spare for sporting purposes, and I thought a gentleman of his eye standing up to have a certainty. Jed! Augustine! I can conceal it no longer. I... I instructed this unworthy creature to back Dandy Dick on behalf of the Restoration Fund. Sir Tristram, shaking Blore. And you didn't do it? No. Why not? In the name of that tottering spire, why not? Hey, sir, thinking as you'd given some of a mixture to Dandy, I put your cheerful little offering on to Bonnie Betsy. Salome and Sheba disappear. Oh, to Blore. I could have pardoned everything but this last act of disobedience. You are unworthy of the deanery. Leave it for some ordinary household. If I leave the deanery, I shall give my reasons. And then what will folks think of you and me in our old age? You wouldn't spread this tale in St. Marble's. Not if sober, sir. But suppose grief drove me to my cups. I must save you from intemperance at any cost. Remain in my service, a sad, sober, and above all, silent man. Salome and Sheba appear as Blor goes out through the window. Papa! To your rooms. I am distracted. Major Tarver and Mr. Dolby. If you have sufficiently merged all sense of moral rectitude as to declare that I am not at home, do so. No, no. Papa, we have accidentally discovered that you, our parents, have stooped to deception, if not to crime. The dean, staggering back. Oh. We are still young. The sooner, therefore, we are removed from any unfortunate influence, the better. We have an opportunity of beginning life afresh. These two gallant gentlemen have proposed for us. Then I am at home. Where are they? He goes out rapidly, followed by Salome and Sheba. Directly they have disappeared, Noah Topping, looking dishevelled, rushes in at the window, with Hannah clinging to him. Noah, glaring round the room. Is this here the deanery? Georgiana and Sir Tristram come to him. Nori, Noah, come back. There's been a man rescued from my lawful custody while my face was unofficially held downwards in the mud. The villain has been traced back to the deanery. Go away. Come away. The man was an unknown lover of my newly made wife. You mustn't bring your domestic affairs here. This is a subject for your own fireside of an evening. The dean appears outside the window with Salome, Sheba, Tarva, and Darby. The dean, outside. Come in, Major Tarver. Come in, Mr. Darby. That's his voice. The dean enters, followed by Salome, Tarva, Sheba, and Darby. Noah, confronting the dean. My man! No, 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 Ray! You're speaking to Dr. Jed, the Dean of St. Marvel's. I'm speaking to the man I took last night. The culprit has as alienated the affections of my wife. Wait one moment. Going out at the window. Salome and Tava go into the library and sit at the writing table. Darby sits in an armchair with Sheba on the arm. 
the dean mildly do not let us chide a man who is conscientious even in error looking at henna i think i see henna evans once an excellent cook under this very roof i'm mrs topping now sir pride of the constable and oh do forgive him he's a massa ignorance come away henna returns to noah as sir tristram re-enters with hatcham sir tristram to hatcham hatcham pointing to the dean is that the man you and the constable secured in the stable last night that sir bless your art sir that's the dean himself that'll do hatcham to noah why our man was a short thin individual hatcham goes out at the window the dean to noah i trust you are perfectly satisfied noah wiping his brow and looking puzzled i'm done don't trouble further i withdraw unreservedly any charge against this unknown person found on my premises last night i attribute to him the most innocent intentions hannah you and your worthy husband will stay and dine in my kitchen good afternoon is it all dinner hot with ale noah turning angrily to hannah now then you don't know a real gentleman when you see one why don't ye thank the dean warmly hannah kissing the dean's hands with a curtsy thank you sir the dean benignly go go i take a kindly interest in you both they back out bowing and curtsying well gus you're out of all your troubles are you happy happy my family influence gone for ever my dignity crushed out of all recognition the genial summer of the deanery frosted by the winter of deceit ah gus when once you lay the whip about the withers of the horse called deception he takes the bit between his teeth and only the devil can stop him and he'd rather not shall i tell you who has been riding the horse hardest who <laughs> the dean georgiana i'm surprised at you sheba sits at the piano and plays a bright air softly darby standing behind her salome and tava stand in the archway georgiana slapping the dean on the back look here augustine george tidd will lend you that thousand for the poor innocent old spire the dean taking her hand oh georgiana on one condition that you'll admit there's no harm in our laughing at the sporting dean no no i cannot allow it tris my brother gus doesn't want us to be merry at his expense <laughs> 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 the dean trying to silence them no no i forbid it hush why Jed, there's no harm in laughter for those who laugh or those who are laughed at provided always firstly that it is folly that is laughed at and not virtue secondly that it is our friends who laugh at us to the audience as we hope they all will for our pains the end end of act three end of dandy dick by arthur wing pinero